This is NOAA's uh, simulation of what the global temperatures would be like going out to the year 2100. Areas in blue will be cooler than today, and areas uh, in red, it is expected to be hotter than today. Uh, there will be uh, you know, scenarios worse than this and scenarios better than this. This is a moderate one. Yeah. As you can see, uh, as we approach the year 2100, in general, uh, temperatures are rising according to their simulation. And uh, for those who in the US who trust their simulation, uh, it's probably a good idea to start buying up land in Portland, Oregon. Right? <laughs> this uh, is a simulation also using rules uh, of uh, swimsuits. Yeah. Uh, during the Beijing Olympics, the LZR Speedo swimsuit was worn, and 23 of the 24 world records at Beijing Olympics for swimming were broken with a swimsuit. Right. And essentially what uh, we did with Speedo was to model the top swimmers in the world using 3D models, uh, run and then to wrap them with material of different kinds, running those simulations in fluids to see which material works best, and also look at different shapes that will be best uh, at uh, high performance, and came up with a material and as you can see later, the silvery area are hard and shaping, and the dark black areas are skin-like to reduce micro turbulences. Yeah. Yes, that's uh, Michael Phelps yeah, swimming there. It was so good that uh, even Nike-sponsored swimmers uh, went up to Nike and say, can I please wear a Speedo? Yes, and Nike, uh, for good patriotic reason, allowed it. Yes, uh, you may want to guess. This is the 4 by 100 meter freestyle record at the Beijing Olympics, and it has still not been broken. 11 years now, wearing that swimsuit. The swimsuit was banned right after the Olympics, so no one can use it, right? So this shows a technological advantage of 11 years. Yeah. But the key point here is, which are the Nike-sponsored swimmers and which are the Speedo-sponsored swimmers? Anyone have a guess? You look at the picture and you can tell. Yes. This is a Speedo-sponsored swimmer. This is a Speedo-sponsored swimmer. This is a Nike-sponsored swimmer. And this is a Nike-sponsored swimmer. Nike said, you know, I let you wear Speedo, but scratch out the logo, right? right. The point uh, we are making, trying to make here is uh, computer modeling and simulation, in this case, could be said to give a head start of 11 years and until today, uh, this 4 by 100 meter record has not been broken. The last time the record stood for s at, at long longest was five years. This is now 11 years. So a set of rules were used to create these models. This is a 3D model of a heart, very high resolution, started at Stanford University. A set of rules were used to model the mechanical compression of the heart, one. Another set of rules were used for the electrical impulses that cause the mechanical contraction, two, set number two. And then a third set of rules were used for the blood flow through the heart. All three rules were combined in a coupled model to create this heart. One of the reasons they do this is to help doctors insert pacemaker wires. I didn't know it was actually just a wire. These wires break often. There was a two-year-old girl that had a defect that needed this wire inserter, and by the time she was 20 years old, she had to be operated on four times to replace broken wires. So this model is used to help the doctors to figure out better insertion models. As you can see, when the heart compresses, this corner tend to be a suspect uh, for wire breaking. I'll show you one set of rules. Any interest uh, as how, what the rules look like to model that blood flow? Okay, don't be too worried. You know, it's, it's, all it is is this. This represents how hard the heart compresses. This represents how thick the blood is. Blood thicker than water, thinner than honey, right? And this represents your blood pressure. The three combine to tell you how the blood flows in the heart. Again a set of rules yeah, to model 
to predict the future. Do we use that in finance? Yes, very similar equation to this, the black scholes merton equation to price your derivatives. You will notice if I go back, you can see a lot of similarities between the two. Right? It is just a set of rules to help you decide how to price your options when you call and put them. Right? The big V is the price of your derivative, the big S is the price of your stock, the underlying asset to your derivatives. Right? The small R is the interest rate, and the squiggle there represents how wild the fluctuation of the price is, and this equation breaks down when it gets too wild, like in 2008. Yeah. It's a set of rules. All these rules are used to plug into the model, send in the current condition in the hopes of predicting the future. This is how I lived for 30 years. That's, that's how I spent my life, right? Helping customers in different sectors build computer system that will run these models well. Do we do this for trading? Yes, we do, right? One of the rules you can write is that if the short-term 50-day moving average cuts over the long-term 200-day moving average of the stock, don't even talk to a human. Just go ahead and buy, right? But of course, every trader will have their own secret sauce to say, you know, if it is raining on Monday, uh, don't buy, right? So these are the kind of rules you put in that human put into these models to predict the future. Then something changed. Yeah. About five years ago, when I went back to Wall Street, I noticed these companies where they were hiring physicists here. They were setting up a separate department and hired data, young data scientists that didn't care about rules. They just don't want to know anything about rules. Don't even want to talk to any experts. All they want are your history and your data and your example. Just give me all the old data you have. And I'm going to write a set of computer programs to consume your data in the hopes that I can predict the future. That's machine learning. So I asked them, how, how, how do you write such a computer program? Actually, if you explain it simply, it's just a bunch of adjustable dials. You send in your first piece of history, predicts wrong, adjust the dial. Second piece of history, ad predict wrong, adjust the dial. 10,000 pieces, 100,000 pieces, a million pieces of trial and error later, your dials get adjusted to a pretty good place to make a prediction. That is machine learning. I, I didn't believe it, right? I was skeptical too. So I went back, I asked one of my intern, you have two weeks. Predict for me whether you rain tomorrow at San Francisco airport, but no rules. Don't talk to meteorologists. Don't open any books on weather forecasting. Just take the 40 years of weather report, data only, history only that have all these 10 factors feed it into the machine. She first set the dials all to neutral, then fit it the first day, predict wrong, adjust the dials. Second day, third day, 10 days, 1,000 days, 10,000 days, and 15,000 days later, this is now the dial setting recipe for predicting whether it rains tomorrow at San Francisco airport. No knowledge of meteorology. Zero knowledge on weather forecasting, just data. That's why it's called data scientists, right? Just using data to figure out the settings of the dials to make a prediction. So I ask her, so how accurate is this? Right? Meteorologist predicting 95% accurate, rain, no rain at San Francisco airport. What's yours? Hers was 85%. Pretty good, not as good as the gold standard or the physics-based, rules-based prediction, but pretty good, especially without any knowledge of the underlying science. You need to also remember to ask the next question. How accurate are you if you always predict no rain? Right? 75%, which means the 85 is good. <laughs> so again, these are the data science things you have to check. Yeah. So they call them, I call them dials for easy understanding. But data science call them weights. How heavy or how important rain today is to raining tomorrow. 
compared to fog today is to raining tomorrow. These are all the weights that matter. So I've shown you five DAOs predicting rain, no rain, San Francisco Airport, 10 DAOs. That's few DAOs, right? Because in an autonomous vehicle, how many DAOs? One billion. And that's the reason why you need data scientists to come in to figure this out. A billion DAOs is a lot, and therefore you need a lot more data to get all those DAOs adjusted right. How are those DAOs uh, connected? One example is through a neural network. Each line represents a dial. How important is that line in the prediction? The line could be thick with a heavy weight, or the line could be thin or non-existent if it is not important. That's how you hear the, about the term neural networks. It is essentially a term to connect the DAOs together. So let's have a look at some examples. The world got together to, to com compete to see who can recognize things in the 14 million images best. In 2010 and 2011, the top teams used the rules-based method to try and recognize things in those 14 million images. While it is not, and they were making 20%, 25% error while a human was making about 5% error. I, I don't know, a poor guy, I do not know if he or she went through the 14 million images, probably a sample. So humans were making 5% error, while the rules-based system were making 25% error. Why? They were very good, the rules-based was very good at predicting and recognizing paintbrushes here, but failed there. They were great at recognizing sunflowers here, but failed there, confused. Because how many more rules do you have to write to anticipate all these different variations in the pictures, right? So what did the new teams do? In 2012, this team got together and used neural network weights and used the 14 million images they are, that are already labeled with what's in there to train their neural networks with. and then they improved to 15% error. And using the same method as it advanced, it has now gone down to 2% error. It is now done. Recognizing op it, the 1,000 objects in the 14 million images, machines are performing at higher precision than humans. Yeah. That's why you hear a lot of uh, AI being used for images. However, 2% error is not 0% error. Therefore, if you put this in an autonomous vehicle, don't expect it to be perfect. That's something to note. These things are not perfect. Well, neither are humans. Right? Yeah. We also use that uh, for a retail customer that has 2,000 retail stores. And for VIP customers that opt in, they want to be recognized any of the 2,000 stores within five seconds, and the store manager rushes forward and shakes the hand and provides a concierge service. In this case, the lesson learned here was that if your proof of concept works for 100 cameras, you have to make sure it also works for 100,000 cameras. Yeah. It's a different infrastructure problem. So AI, machine learning also have a scalability problem that has to be considered when you go into production. We will call to a hospital in a city with high incidences of tuberculosis to the extent that the city decided to x-ray everybody above a certain age. The only problem is they can x-ray quickly, but the diagnosis took two weeks. Backlog. The problem with that two weeks is that if someone is positive, he or she may go out and continue to spread the disease for two weeks before being called. So we were called in, we took all the old images that were already diagnosed and labeled by the doctors, trained the neural network. This X-ray, chest X-ray image has no TV. This chest X-ray image has no TV. This chest X-ray uh, image has TV, and so on. And then now we plug this system right next to the X-ray machine, and right after one X-ray of a patient, within a second, the machine will say, you are okay. 
Oh, by the way, you still have to wait two weeks for the doctor to certify you're okay, right? But if you are not okay, the doctor rushes in and stops the spread of the disease. Yeah. So this application has profound meaning. Right? Any Formula One fans here? Yeah, thank you, right? Uh, we, last year, we started a project uh, to help use machine learning to design uh, the Mercedes F1 Formula One car, both for Bottas 77 and, uh, and Lewis Hamilton 44, car number 44. Uh, did not sleep well for three nights during the first race because if they didn't win, right? Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, so far after 14 races, they have won 10 and uh, seven of which were first and second. So, so far so good. I'm sure it is the driver, yeah, right. Uh, if I stood next to Hamilton, uh, other people have, so you know, to convince you that we work closely uh, with Mercedes, uh, I stood behind the red line pit lane while Hamilton's car was being assembled before he goes out on the race, and you notice the engineer did not kick me out. Yeah. So we work uh, with them to design their cars. Yeah. Yeah. We also put one, an autonomous, people build autonomous cars. We put in effort to build autonomous computer systems. So we put one on a space station. The dotted line is where the SpaceX capsule will be docked. And then the full line is where the astronaut will be bringing the two servers that we've launched up there from our price book, straight off our price book without modification, to be installed uh, on the space station. The goal here is to put all the smarts in the computer so that uh, the astronaut need not have to maintain it. Yeah, although if it need to be fixed, I got a lot of volunteers from my engineers to fly up there to fix it, but uh, I told them, not possible. So the system has to be smart and autonomous. We spent six months making sure nothing went wrong, yeah, together with the team, all the complicated stuff, and forgot that the cables were too short. Yeah. Lesson learned here. Sometimes it is the simple things that get you. <laughs> and you will see the... HPE logo there to prove that it's really up there. Yeah. Astronaut Mark Van der Hey. Yeah. And uh, a year later, a year and a half later, April 30th, just recently, uh, astronaut Christina Koch uh, deinstalled it. And it's now flown back. You can see it's being deinstalled. It's now flown back uh, on Earth. Uh, it landed uh, off the coast of uh, California. Uh, it went through a very harsh entry where you can see uh, we affectionately call it the toasted marshmallow. Right? And we took the server out, uh, tested it again, and it continued working autonomously. So to just show you that computer system, off-the-shelf computer system, have, has advanced to a certain point that they have gone through this harsh uh, journey and still uh, work properly, albeit with the fact that we loaded it with a lot of smarts in there. It has since won the NASA Exceptional Technology Medal for contribution to their space program. All these examples I've shown you are examples where the prediction objective is passive. You just need to predict accurately what it is. Yeah. Right? There's a new kind of AI system where you have to deal with the fact that the objective is not passive. It's constantly adjusting its strategy and you have to keep up with it. Games is a good way to measure how good you are at dealing with an actively changing objective. So we know IBM, with full respect, beat the world top chess player in 97. Fewer people know that University of Alberta beat the world top checkers players two years before that. Great respect to Google to have beaten the world top Go player because this is one, this is the most difficult game there is in combinations. I don't know of any game having more combinations than this. Do you know how big this number is? This number is a crazy, 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 crazy big number, right? I mean, if we took all the computers in the world, put them together, run them for 100 years, we only get to 10 to the power of 30, let alone 171, yeah? So we do not solve Go. Neither do we solve chess. We barely solve checkers, right? We are only good enough in a machine to beat humans. Another thing to note, right? we don't solve. 
The combination is just too great to solve. We have gone through enough of the combinations to be able to beat humans. Humans with 50 years of experience and reading books would not have covered as many combinations as the machine has, even though the machine has not completed all the combinations. Something to note when later we compare humans to machine. I had to figure out what to do here. No more game more complicated than Go. So I controversially picked poker. Right. All right. Now, poker, Texas heads up no limit. Hold'em poker is less complex than Go, but it's still a big number. But it has one thing more complex than the rest, and that is your opponent cards are hidden from you. Not only that, your opponent is constantly trying to deceive you. So, IBM, to show that the machine beats human, goes to a formal chess tournament. Right? Google went to a formal Go tournament. Uh, we went to a casino. <laughs> uh, Jason left on the right, one of the four world top poker players. In 2015, we lost $700,000. Had to explain to the CEO, <laughs> together with CMU, Carnegie Mellon University. So we, we interviewed the four top poker players and asked them, so what was it about the machine that you managed to outwit? Because we observed that the machine was doing better at the beginning, and eventually it lost big at the end. So what was it that you managed to figure out? Ah, almost all four said, you know, it did not bluff very well. Okay, so Professor Sandholm at CMU went back and said, I need a machine 10 times bigger, and I'm going to train the machine on nothing but bluffing for one year. How, do he, how does he do it? He just builds two machines to play poker even randomly, never mind at the beginning. But every time one of them stumbles upon a win due to a bluff, it gives it a great reward. And after one trillion tries, he gets pretty good at bluffing, hopefully. 2017, we went back and competed again in the casino, and we won $1.7 million. And this machine has not lost since. Many people wanted, it's like the Wild West, right? Everybody wanted to compete against it, and it has not lost since. Of course, it is banned from casinos, eh? Yeah. Interesting thing, we asked the four top poker players again. So what's different now? It is totally opposite now. At the beginning, the humans were doing better, and then after, eventually, after 120,000 hands, the humans lost big. It was a total opposite. Then we asked them what happened. They said, yeah, oh, it bluffed really well now. It bluffed like no human. In fact, they almost said it bluffed like an alien. Yeah. Yeah. Something to note about what you can do with machine by just using combinations and eventually explore enough of a space that humans have not so far ventured albeit that it has not explored all of the space. That's a key point to remember, which means it is still prone to mistakes. It is just better than humans. So to summarize, in the old days of big data, we built analytical tools and we hired analysts, human-in-the-loop analysts, to crunch through the data using tools. And then we moved up to machine learning, where we built computer program to let the program loose on the data, to crunch through on its own, and eventually figured out how to make a prediction, because it has enough reinforcement as to what's right, what's correct, and what's incorrect, what's a good prediction, and what's not a, what's not a good prediction. And when a machine can learn on its own, I think many people call it artificially intelligent. But we shouldn't call those rules-based systems that are predicting weather 95% accurate as dumb machines, right? They are also intelligent machines, but the industry tend to call artificial intelligent machines because they can learn on their own. While the rules-based machine needs to have the rules handed to them by Nobel laureates. Yeah. Yeah. When you give an intelligent machine the ability to act, we call it aut autonomous. 
And when you give it the ability to transact with money, we call it independence. So you can think of the world where you have uh, an autonomous car that has learned to be intelligent and holding a Bitcoin wallet. You buy the car and you let the car loose. And it goes on its own uh, doing uh, pickup rides, earns money into its wallet. If it needs to be fixed, it does a reverse auction to the shops and it drives itself to be shop to be fixed and pays for it. Five years later, it drives back to your doorstep and say, here's your money, I'll drive myself to the scrap yard. And you get one last transaction for the scrap metal. <laughs> That's an independent machine world. It's just a picture, right? But these technologies are all there. It is whether we allow it. So imagine the world of independent machines. And then the last one is, of course, there's lots of questions. Will it ever you know, become conscious? Sentience is where, if this is a philosophical question, I don't want to deal with it, but I call sentience more something like a machine feeling pain. Consciousness is when it can sense others, and self-aware is the toughest, is when it senses itself. You know, we humans are not self-aware until 18 months old. Right? And how do we test it? Asleep, put a red dot, open eye, look at mirror. Do we scratch it or do we wonder what the red dot is? Yeah. So we test it on bonobos and chimps and some of them succeed. Yeah. So they are self-aware. Yeah. So are we worried? My point of this uh, presentation is that as, you are, as we are being worried, we first need to understand the differences between natural and artificial intelligence. First and foremost, the brain is still today about, in my opinion, one million times more complex than the biggest neural network out there. We know this because of the work with the Blue Brain Project in Geneva, where one connection in the brain today is represented by one dial, which is one weight, which is one number. The Blue Brain Project has discovered that a human brain connection is complex enough to require 20 equations to model. A one connection of the 100 trillion is a lot more complex than our artificial neural network today. Just one example. That's the reason why uh, when we were young, we can be shown maybe 10, 20 pictures of giraffes in different settings, and we'll know what a giraffe is. But machine neural network will require thousands of images. That's also the reason why uh, machines are very task-specific. Example, an autonomous car company trained in Europe, brought to Australia, lots of problems with kangaroos, right? Because it was trained on bipedal walking and quad trotting, but not bipedal hopping. Very, very specific. But humans tend to be able to generalize a bit more. The first time we see a kangaroo, we, we know it is an animal. Yeah. Transient bias. Bias is talked about a lot. This neural network will have all our human biases. Because if you fed it with all of human history, all of our biases will be in it. However, we have also transient biases. Biases that we have right now, but after tea break, the biases is gone, transient. Yeah? Uh, an expression of it would be the contrast effect. We put our hand in almost hot water, we take it out and put it in warm water, and that feels deceivingly cold. That is, if we are inundated, if we inundate our senses with something, we tend to get bias away from it. Yeah? Subtractive. Few people know that when we are young, before three years old, our brains are actually much more connected than today. Much more, 15,000 connections when we are three years old and younger. But from three years to 30 years, our brains start to prune those connections. That is, connections you don't use, it prunes away. So keep your brains active for those under 30. The reason is, very likely, the brain wants to be highly energy efficient. 
it only takes about 20 watts to power our brain, 100 watts for the whole body, right? That, that's only about one slice of pizza. So every time I, my, I need my engineers to work longer, I would buy them a pizza, hand them the slice, and say, oh, three more hours. Yeah. <laughs> we also are great filterers. That could be a problem, that could be a good thing, because we live in a very noisy world. In a wine party, when I talk to someone, I can actually fill out the, filter out the background noise. But do note that it creates a mental load on us. One example, an airport in Germany, when they move the airport from the old city to the new city, the grades of the great school in the new city dropped, while the grades of the great school in the old city went up. So background noise and the ability to filter it exerts a cost on us. Yeah. And then finally, while neural networks are monolithic, our brains are hierarchical. Right? When we see something, immediately our logic center controls it. Also automatically is connected to our emotional center. And our emotional center is regulated by a logical logic center. So it is a loop, right? One, two, and three. The problem is if we don't get enough sleep, for example, this connection weakens. And if we don't get enough dream sleep, our emotional baseline is not moderated when we wake up. Yeah. That's the reason why uh, maybe uh, more and more now people are realizing not just to do a breathalyzer test before you do an important task, to also check whether you slept enough, and maybe in the future, more importantly, did you have enough REM sleep, at least two hours, yeah. or dream sleep. Yeah. Dream sleep is becoming more and more important. Uh, that's uh, what paleontologists said, right? Uh, six million years ago, we all live, sleep in trees together with the chimps and bonobos. Bonobos is a smart one too, yeah? So are chimps. But between six million years, and, and uh, we couldn't dream sleep very much. Why? Dream sleep means our muscles relax and we fall off trees, yeah? Right. But between six million years and two million years, we started to spend more and more time on the ground. Maybe because we fall off too often and decided, hack it, we just sleep on the ground, yeah? Right? Sleeping on the ground, our REM sleep increased from 10% to 25% as we are today, and our brain increased two times in size. Yeah. Right. So dream sleep, dream a lot. Yeah. So sometimes I wonder if it is a good thing to wake up our kids to rush them to school. Yeah. Maybe I tell my kids, just sleep. Yeah. I'll write a note to the teacher. <laughs> so the point here I'm making uh, is, while the machine continues to con uh, take over more and more of our tasks, not our jobs, making the correct decisions in our place, we humans still need to be there because we apply judgment automatically to, to be there to make sure that the correct decision is also the right decision. Maybe in the future, there has to be a difference between the two. But being, making, being there for the right decision can also be a problem because sometimes we can be wrong. Let's have a look at this example. I need uh, audience participation, please. You can see that uh, these are ridges that sticks out of the screen, while these are indentations that goes into the screen. Please raise your hands if you see a change, a flip, especially after he has done one full turn. Please raise your hands so I get an idea, right? It is okay to close your eyes for a second and open again at this stage. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. 12, 13, 14, 15. Yes, some see it, some don't. Never mind, some see it later, some see it sooner. It is okay, right? All right, next question. Who still sees it moving? Ah, right. Second, second difference. Some people see it, some people don't. Third question. Who feels a little queasy? Okay, some people feel queasy. Some, by the way, those people who feel queasy have very sensitive vestibular system, meaning eye sees movement, uh, inner ear says no movement, conflict, best to throw up, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the early uh, 60s, when they hired fi fighter pilots in the US, they then first, these, these freshmen, put them up in the fighter aircraft and do crazy maneuvers and see who throw up first and kick them out. 
now they realize they kicked out the wrong people. Because in the world of instrument and darkness flying, you want people with very, very sensitive vestibular that still know where they are. And you can always use medication to suppress the, the urge to throw up. Yeah? So great fighter pilot, yeah? Jennifer, yeah, right. And the reason it, uh, when it turned one uh, upside down, right, uh, some see the ridges become indentation, yeah, craters become uh, uh, hollows and hollows become craters. It's because for the lack of a visual cue of where the light source is, we humans always assume it's from the top. Right? And once the picture rotated 100 degrees, 180 degrees, I did not show you where the light source is, you assume it's still from the top and everything flips. Right? So the message here, just by this simple demonstration, is that we are the purveyors and the judge of what's right, what well, the machine does the correct decision. But do note that we are fallible. Yeah? Right? On this note, thank you very much, and we go to the panel. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for that very clear explanation of the difference between natural and artificial intelligence. Let's now talk a little bit about how should business think about this, right? Because m banks, financial services companies are starting to automate uh, back office functions, yes. even some customer facing uh, applications. Um, what are how should they be thinking about what to entrust mm. to artificial intelligence today? One thing we've observed, at least uh, for the state of the art, yeah, uh, AI systems that learned from data, right, is, is that uh, they are highly specific, very narrow, don't generalize well, right? And as such, uh, they'll be great and at high accuracy take over very specific tasks. So, you know, my suggestion always is that make sure your job is multi-skill, right? And then you will, a uh, machine can't take over that in a general sense, right? A doctor is multi-skilled, right? There is a, firstly responsibility and a human touch, right? The ability to stand up to say, I make this prediction and I'm going to uh, be responsible for it. But for a machine, it's different. Yeah? So multi-skilled jobs, right, will, will stay. And those certain parts of, uh, certain of those skills will be taken over my machine, but the human will be there to make sure everything is uh, right. Yeah. So for the, sh say, short term, you know, it's really more the mundane uh, tasks yes. that will free humans up uh, to multitask and do more interesting uh, work. Um, but the artificial intelligence will augment us rather than replace us in the short term. What are some of the critical questions that business should be asking when they start to um, give more important decision-making powers to artificial intelligence? Because as we heard earlier today, there will be um, even a regulatory requirement yes to be able to explain the decision-making process. And there may be legal consequences, because as you said, a human yeah. can take responsibility, but yeah. can an AI? Yes, uh, that's a great question. You know, we've been working with pharmaceutical companies, right? All these years, they use a rules-based way to figure out what new drug that can target a disease. And then they bring it, uh, they bring it to uh, the FDA for approval, and, being able, and then able to explain the process of arriving at that new protein that can target uh, this disease and mitigate it. But now they're using machine learning that is less transparent as with the other speakers, right? Uh, you, you cannot get the machine to predict that this is a good uh, drug for this target and then go to the FDA with it because if the FDA asks you how do you arrive at this, oh, I don't know, the machine told me, right? right? And it's not, it's not transparent. So what do they do today? Today, what they do is they get the uh, the machine learning way to give a, 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 a proposed uh, drug, and then they take that drug and go to the rules-based way to validate it. So the gold standard is still going to be a rules-based way. Right? And of course, ultimately, uh, someone has to sign off on it and say, I'm going, I'm, as a human, I'm going to be responsible for that. Yeah. Yeah. As an artificial intelligence expert, 
how should business people think about the timeline? Because oh. we're reading a lot about autonomous yeah. cars, they're coming quickly, and the cars will be making decisions that people make today about yeah. traffic and everything else. So yeah. what do you think, how long will it take before we move from machine learning, artificial intelligence, to artificial yeah. uh, AG or what So we've done, we've done uh, to that point, 100 over use cases uh, at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Um, a good reasonable amount of them uh, became productively successful, right? And one of the things we learn is always under promise, not the other way around. Because the expectations are so huge that this thing is gonna do magic, right? No, try to make it very specific as to what you're trying to predict. The more specific it is, the better the prediction quality, and more importantly, the better at sustaining that prediction quality over time. That's important because you, you get 97% accuracy, deploy it, one year later it drops to 93, right? Because you have not considered taking in new data and do lifelong learning with that machine. So expectation setting, right? Be very narrow about what you're trying to predict, as narrow as possible. That's why it's task, right? That way you have a better chance of getting production quality, scalable prediction quality, and able to sustain it. The other thing is set the expectation that it's going to take you a long time to get there, right? If you get it faster, your management will be happy, right? Long time because data. A lot of times you just don't have the data or don't have enough good quality data. Or you have data that is biased, that you're worried about, that you wrongfully train this machine to make good decisions sometimes, but very, very bad ones those few times. Yeah. So sometimes you also need a rules-based system to envelope it to make sure it don't, doesn't go crazy. Because it doesn't have judgment, remember? Right? If, it, if it makes a mistake, sometimes, most of the time, those few mistakes it makes are crazy mistakes. Yeah? No judgment. So all these require still human intervention at the back end. Right? Um, uh, the other third thing is trust. We have examples where you know, uh, a, a, a city uh, deployed these trains that are driverless. The first month, nobody rode it. Very few people rode it. Didn't trust it, right? Then, what the city did was to put drivers that just stood there, did nothing, so that people could see that there is someone at, at the front of the car, right, front car, and the road, uh, ride started. And then eventually, uh, what the, the drivers were removed. Also remember, autonomous cars are not full autonomous, right? There are five levels. Level one, two, three, that's the best we do today. Level three still requires a driver to be responsible, meaning that if he can't handle it, the driver must wake up and take over. Three is a quite dangerous one because you tend to get complacent. The driver tend to get complacent. Four is fully driverless only for certain conditions. And five is driverless for all conditions and we are not there. It still takes a while, right? So. It won't be fully autonomous all over the world uh, immediately. It'll still take a while. I mean, autopilot has been around 100 years. Right? We still have pilots, huh? right? Uh, we, we want them there. Yeah. Yeah. So you bring up a great point about trust uh, and trustworthy AI and, uh, and how business should think about it. Um, I was speaking to a cybersecurity company that has um, has a product where the, the AI not only detects an intrusion, but automatically can go out and do something about it without any human intervention. But the companies, the clients, were so nervous about yes. not having that, that they had to actually build some kind of a, a button. That a a would, check. Yeah. Yes, that would yeah. allow that checking. We, we see that in many places, right? I, uh, we, we had one uh, uh, competitive team that we did machine learning, and the car was great, right? Uh, not Mercedes, something else, right? The car was great, right? We managed to reduce, through machine learning, an analysis from two weeks down to one day. Yeah, that's why the car was great, right? Because our design now is two weeks faster than everybody else, right? When I went back there and asked them, so what is the reduction now? Is it two weeks to one day? No, it's two weeks to one week. Why are you doing with the rest of the six days? Oh, I'm using the six days to check the answer of the machine. Ah, but it's already very great, right? Because it's already two times more faster than things are. I'm really very happy, uh, but I still want to check it. 
for six months, they checked it. Right? After six months, they let it go and got to one day. The, the trust part takes a while. So if you are implementing uh, an AI system, all right, set the expectation with the management that initially you wouldn't get all the gains yeah, because you haven't trusted it yet. Neither will the management, especially, when, when, for example, Swift. Right? <laughs> one last question about data, because you mentioned, well, you know, you, people don't have the right data or maybe their data isn't clean, they have to repair it, which is, of course, Always important. Biased. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but um, the question I have is, um, a lot of established companies, including banks or insurance companies, might worry that they will never have as much data as the internet giants. Um, how much do you really need? Like, you, you only need as, yeah. you, don't, you don't need billions of data points, right? Yeah. If, depending on the application, you, you only need a certain threshold. So yes. uh, it's, yeah. the game isn't over, yeah. right? It, it varies, right? Uh, typically, for image recognition, uh, for certain specific tasks, maybe 100,000 images with labeled well, right? Uh, is a good start. Uh, typically, they like you know more than that, maybe a million. Um, I think the the point here is that uh, don't delete your data in enterprises, right? They are the new intellectual property. Convince your board that keeping data and organizing them well at good quality is a competitive advantage for the future. Right, uh, you have to start there. Secondly, um, if if you still don't have enough, right, uh, start collecting earnestly. Uh, give you an example: a city in Bonn have decided to invest money to MRI scan 30,000 of their residents and scan them every three years for 30 years. This is a big investment of data collection, a commitment, right? But it's for an investment future. for the future. For the future. The goal is that, uh, if hopefully not, if some of them uh, develop Alzheimer's, then now you have a 10-scan record of what it looked like uh, 30 years ago in the hopes that we can treat this disease better. This is a commitment to collect data. If that fails too, form consortiums. No choice. Right? You have Visa, American Express, credit card companies coming together sharing fraud information banks through SWIFT, huh, sharing fraud information. All these are things that uh, where a consortium is necessary even though you're competitors. Yeah? In all, because you have an even bigger adversary out there. Yeah? Because, of the, because of the network effect. Yes, yeah. correct. Yeah. Right. Well, great advice, I'm sure. Please give a big hand to Dr. Go. You. you know, I, can, I, can I say something? You know, I, I've always been asked, right? Uh, uh, it, is, it is good to note that, uh, you know, this last 50,000 years, there were actually three or more species on Earth, the Neanderthals, the Denis Denisovans, and us. And we are the only ones left called Homo sapiens, right? right? So, you know, if you think of the term Homo sapiens, it means wise person. Yeah? It's good that we live, live up to the name we give ourselves. Right? So let's be right more of the time yeah, in the way we uh, deal with machines. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you.